Hey everyone, in this video we're going to be writing all of these complex numbers here in polar form. Now, when it comes to complex numbers, there are two ways of writing a complex number. The first way is called rectangular form, which is x plus iy. Now, you can consider a point on the complex plane according to its real and imaginary part, where the real part is, is the x-coordinate and the imaginary part is the y-coordinate. So in this instance, I have my basis vector, which is just one, and I have x copies of them. And then for my imaginary vector, i, I have y copies of those. So that the vertical distance of this point can be represented by the imaginary part of the complex number and the horizontal distance to the right can be represented by the real part of that imaginary number. And so this is just rectangular coordinates. This is just the Euclidean plane that you learn about in high school, your XY graph. Now there's another way of framing a point on the complex plane. Now yes, every point can be represented by some horizontal distance and then some vertical distance. Well, I can construct an angle here and encode the specific location of my point, my complex number, using not the x and y coordinate, but the angle measure of this corresponding angle. and the distance from the origin. And we call this the polar form. And we write r e to the i phi. So when it comes to the rectangular form and the polar form then, x plus i y is a representation using standard rectangular coordinates where x is the horizontal distance and y is the vertical distance of this complex number from the origin. Or, we can represent a complex number according to this length and angle measure that we get, which is unique, any point can be represented in rectangular coordinates or polar coordinates. And so we can write this complex number as a pair r and theta, where r is the length away from the origin and theta is the corresponding angle measure. In radians, by the way, we're working in radians. Now I wanna mention a couple things. Why do I write it r e to the i theta and not just r comma theta, right? Like why write the e and the i part when in reality the only information I need is the r and the theta. The information encoded in three e to the two i I can just write this as three comma two where the first coordinate is r and the second coordinate is my angle measure theta. This result, by the way, we're making a definition. This is a definition here, a conceptual understanding as to why this is the way it is. I could probably do a video on that in the future. But to make things simple, this is a definition. This is just the definition. So if I write e to the negative pi i, and you're like, what the heck is that, right? Well, by definition, this is defined to be cosine of negative pi plus i sine of negative pi which by the way is just negative one. 
which can also be thought as negative one plus zero i. All right, so now take a look at this right here, zero i. Should it be zero i or i zero? Zero in this case is a real number, the imaginary part of this complex number, which is also a complex number, but I want you to frame the components x and y here as real numbers, which are complex numbers, yes, but it's significant that x and y are real numbers too. And so zero here, yes, it's a complex number, but I want you to frame it as a real number. And if you've taken linear algebra, I want you to consider zero as a scalar. It's not even the zero vector, it's a scalar. And usually we write scalars before the vectors. All right, so let's start with A of problem 1.4. This problem can be found in your free complex analysis textbook, and I'll leave a link in the description below. It's online, it's a great resource, check that out. So 2i you can think of as zero plus 2i, so that if we were to consider this number on the complex plane, If this is our complex plane right here, then 2i, which is 0 plus 2i, would be right here. Now this complex number is two units away from the origin, and it makes a right angle with the positive x-axis here. So this angle where you measure between the rays that extend from the origin to the positive x-axis and the ray extending from the origin to the complex number that we're looking at, 2i. And so 2i is r e to the i phi, 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 I don't know. <laughs> but I know what r is, r is two. And I also know what phi is, pi over two. And so this is just two e to the pi over two times i. And that right there is all in the exponent of E. Now I wanna mention one quick side note. Cosine and sine are periodic functions, meaning that the outputs repeat in like these cyclic patterns. And when I mean cyclic, I mean you can change the input by a certain number and you'll get the same result. Now, cosine and sine both have a period of two pi. And so if you add two pi to both of these angle measures, you would not be changing the value of your complex number. So what does that mean? Well, that means that, yes, this angle measure is pi over two, but you can also consider a very similar angle. This angle I'm gonna draw in black. Now this angle looks the same, but it's actually a different angle than the one I drew underneath it. How so? Well, you can't really see this visually, but this black angle with black rays, is twisted in the sense that the angle measure is over two pi radians, over a full rotation. So this is two pi plus pi over two radians, which is five pi over two radians. So two i, 
can be encoded with r equals 2 and phi equals pi over 2, or we could do 5 pi over 2. That also works. Again, this is a definition. So you might have this like notion of, wait, you can't just change the exponent and get the same number. Yes, you can. So this is equal to 2 e to the 5 pi over 2 i as well. And we can keep doing this because sine and cosine are periodic every 2 pi. And so there we have it. We have our polar form for the complex number 2i. It's 2 times e to the pi over 2i. Let's do some more practice. 1 plus i. Well, I think this is easy enough to graph. Some of these problems, it'll be easy enough to graph and just kind of look at it and think about it and process the geometry of the situation in that context. Now, not all of these problems that we're going to be doing in this video can be done by just graphing. So we'll have to find some algebraic means of solving some of these in the future. But this one is straightforward enough to just graph and just look at the geometry of it all. So 1 plus i is right here. 1 plus i. Okay, and so now we can draw our corresponding angle. And so we have this r length, the length from the origin, and this corresponding angle measure, theta. Now let's start with theta because this makes a straight up 45 degree angle. Oops, dang it, I used degrees. Don't do that. <laughs> this is actually pi over four radians. Or you can also think about it as 9 pi over 4 radians, which is just an extra twist. And then we can add another twist to get 17 pi over 4 radians. All of these are potential thetas or angle measures, and I'm going back and forth between phi and theta, and that's because this textbook uses phi and I use theta for angle measures. I'll probably end up doing that many times throughout this course and I really don't want to correct that every single time. Okay, so up next we have r. What's my r value here? Well, I'm trying to find the length of that purple line segment there. I have a right triangle here that has lengths one on the legs and so the hypotenuse would be the square root of 2 here. And so r is the square root of 2. Which means that my polar form is r times e to the i theta, which is pi over 4. Or 9 pi over 4, you could have picked that one too. I like picking the one that's between 0 and 2 pi. But if you like to do the twist, you know, or whatever, go ahead. So that's the polar form of 1 plus i. All right, let's do the next one. Negative 3 plus the square root of 3 times i. And I noticed that the author in this case put the i after the square root of 3. And I don't like doing that. But it's all just a matter of habits. The commutative property makes us all right. Now this is a little bit tougher than the last couple problems and the reason for that is because 
this complex number is over here where the horizontal distance here is 3 and the vertical distance is the square root of 3. And so I get this weird right triangle and then I have to figure out what this corresponding angle is here and what the length of the hypotenuse of this right triangle is. Right? And we could do that. But at some point we should admit that there's probably a better way of going about this. And there is. But then why didn't you show me that earlier, Cody? You should have shown me that earlier. Why did you show me the long way first again? You should have shown me the first, the short way first. If you want a short way, yeah? Right, okay. Okay, so this is already in rectangular form. This is my x plus y i, i y by commutative property. Now, if you recall, by definition, e to the i theta is equal to cosine theta plus i sine theta. Now, this definition is very useful. However, I think a more useful definition is if you multiply both sides by r to get r e to the i theta equals r times cosine theta plus i sine theta. Now, why do I prefer this definition better? Well, that's because cosine of theta cannot be negative 3. The only outputs of cosine of theta are between negative 1 and positive 1. And so we just can't get negative 3. And so we have to recognize that negative 3 is not just my cosine theta here. Negative 3 is r times cosine of theta. And so if I want to be able to do a direct translation here between x and cosine theta, y and, co and sine theta, I need to first know that this vector here, this number, actually has a length of 1, a size of 1. And usually that's not the case with most of the problems that we're going to be working with throughout this course. So most of the time I can't just say x equals cosine theta. No, x equals r times cosine theta. So let me just summarize everything I'm saying here. x equals r cosine theta. y equals r sine theta. Okay, well this gives me a formula that can help me figure out what x and y are. But I know what x and y are. x is negative 3 and y is the square root of 3. So I would like a formula that can help me find r and theta specifically. Luckily for us, though, there are formulas for this. So in this instance, we know what x and y are, but we don't know what the corresponding length from the origin and angle measure for theta are. We don't know those. How can we find r and theta if we know what x and y are? Well, the answer is just a little bit of trig. We can say that x squared plus y squared equals r squared, which means that r equals the square root of x squared plus y squared, which, by the way, is just the magnitude of the complex number we're looking at. Just a side note. So this right here, this r, it represents the size of a complex number. So this means then that the size of a complex number is just the distance that complex number is from the origin of the complex plane. So that length is length in the complex plane. So think about the real number line for a moment. The real number line, when you think about the length of a number, you try to measure how far that number is 
from the origin, from zero. So then how do we find theta? This is the one that a lot of students struggle with, and I understand why. So first I want to point out that cosine of theta is x over r, and sine of theta is y over r, and tangent of theta is y over x. And so you can use inverse trig functions to figure out what theta is if you know what x and y are. And if you know what x and y are, and you don't know what r is, then this formula is probably the one that I would recommend. If you're given rectangular coordinates, this formula doesn't require that you solve for r first. And so theta in this instance is just tangent inverse of y over x. Now, I say this with like an asterisk because the trig function tangent is not an invertible function. You can't just take the inverse of the tangent function. So the tangent function is not a bijection. And so because of that, we can't just take the inverse. There is no inverse to the tangent function. And so this thing right here is not the inverse of tangent. It's called tangent inverse, but that's not what it is because there's no such thing. So this is the closest function that we can get to simulate what an invertible function would look like. Um, and so it's a useful tool in figuring out what your angle measure here is. But don't rely on it. Do not rely on your calculator just to just give you the answer. Once you get an answer, you should then determine if it makes sense. Now you're given X and Y coordinates, you're given rectangular coordinates, and so you should be able to determine what quadrant you're in pretty quickly. And you should be able to verify whether or not the angle measure you calculate here is the one that makes sense, that, that the angle measure lands you in the right quadrant. You want to be in the right quadrant. If you're not in the right quadrant, then that's because this inverse function isn't being super user-friendly for you in the, that specific context. And unfortunately, we all have to pay that price. That said, I want to mention one key important note. That this formula here does not work if x is 0. If you want to find your angle measure when x is 0, don't use this formula because there's a division of zero there. And so I would recommend using this formula. And if X is zero, then that just means this whole thing is just zero. And cosine of theta is zero precisely when theta is pi over two plus or minus some integer multiple of pi. So let's get back to the problem then. This means that negative three equals r cosine theta and the square root of 3 equals r sine theta and tangent of theta is the square root of 3 all over negative 3. Now r is the square root of negative 3 squared plus the square root of 3 squared, which is the square root of 9 plus 3, which is just the square root of 12. So we have r. This is my r. And then theta is just tangent inverse of the square root of 3 all over negative 3 which is now I want to show you all something kind of interesting 
This says that tangent inverse of square root of three over negative three is negative 0.5235 and so on, right? And if you know that your answer is some rational multiple of pi, which it probably is by the way, then let's divide this number by pi. Check this out. I get negative 0.16666, which with a calculator, you if you hit math, enter, enter, you can convert that last number to a fraction. So if I divide my result by pi, I get negative one sixth. If I divide my result by pi, I get negative one sixth. This means my result is negative pi over six. But now we need to write the polar form of this. We have our angle measure negative pi over six. Wait a minute, do we have our ma angle measure here? Does negative pi over six make sense? Well, no, because I should be in my second quadrant. This is negative three plus square root of three i. In rectangular coordinates, I should be in quadrant two, but negative pi over six is quadrant four. And so what happened here? Well, tangent inverse only gives me angle measures from negative pi over two to pi over two. Tangent inverse isn't gonna help me out if my angle measure is between pi over two and three pi over two. At least not that much. And so I wanna clarify, negative pi over six is not the right angle measure. It's not that I add an, need to add two pi to get the correct angle measure. It's that I just picked up the wrong angle measure because tangent theta is not the greatest inverse function because tangent is not an invertible function. So I have to do some geometry to acknowledge that if I wanna get the actual angle, angle measure, I need to add pi radians. So the actual angle measure theta here, the real one, the one that we're trying to get at, it's just negative pi over six plus a half rotation, which is five pi over six. That's my theta. And so the polar form of negative three plus the square root of three i is r, which is the square root of 12, times e to the i theta, i times theta, which is five pi over six. And that's the polar form. I do wanna mention one side note. Some textbooks will have you write this in a different form. This is another representation of the same amount of information, but it's just, it's so many letters that really we're just encoding two numbers into this. Square root of 12 and five pi over six. Everything else here is just theater. Let's keep going. Negative i Well, first we need to figure out what r is. r is the square root of 0 squared plus negative 1 squared, which is just 1. Okay. Uh and then let's figure out what theta is. Theta is tangent inverse of negative one over zero. And that's problematic, so this is not gonna help us. Maybe we can do 
cosine inverse of my x value here, which is zero, divided by my length r, which is one, which is cosine inverse of zero. which is pi over two. Now, does pi over two make sense geometrically or did cosine inverse screw us over? So in reality, theta is actually three pi over two. And so that means negative i can be written in polar form of one times e to the i times three pi over two. Now here is a geometric interpretation of the multiplication of two complex numbers. So if I have a complex number w and another complex number z, according to this picture here, if I multiply two numbers z and w, then the corresponding result will have an angle measure of the addition of the two angle measures of z and w. And the length, of this vector is going to be the length of w times the length of z. So that's a geometric interpretation of the multiplication of two complex numbers. We could write 2 minus i in polar form and then square the result, which it's easy to work with polar form, especially when you're doing exponentiation, multiplication. Yeah, it's really nice to work with polar form in my opinion. And that's the way I want to do this problem. So on our complex plane here, two minus i is right there. And so I have to figure out what this angle measure is. It's almost a full rotation. So I should get something close to two pi. Now to be specific here, theta is gonna be tangent inverse. of negative one over two, that would be the corresponding lengths here, one and two, technically negative one because we're below the x-axis. And so tangent inverse of negative one half, which is, so according to my calculator, I get negative 0.46, Four, and I'll just round right there, radians. Now that's a negative angle measure, but we're in the same quadrant. We're still in quadrant four, so technically this works. And then my corresponding R would be the square root of 2 squared plus negative 1 squared. Which is just the square root of 5. And so this number right here is the square root of 5 e to the negative 0.464 i and then all squared don't forget that square we haven't done that part yet but the reason why i chose to do this method is because once you're in polar form it's really easy to stay in polar form it's really convenient for example exponentiation works the same here i can distribute the square to each 
of square root of 5 and e to the negative 0.464i. And this gives me the square root of 5 squared is just 5. And then for the exponent, I multiply to get negative 0 0.9. to 8i and technically the final answer should be that should be rounded to a 7 but something something sig figs I don't care if you're a scientist then you should work that out yourself because I didn't sign up for that you did so this is the polar form of 2 minus i squared Let's move on to part F. So this is kind of interesting. We have the absolute value of three minus four I in front of us here. That's the problem that we're doing right now. We're supposed to find the polar form of this, not just this, but this. So keep in mind that the absolute value of any complex number is a real number. So this right here is a real number. So just so that everyone understands. So we're gonna write the polar form of a real number. Let's figure out what this number is before we start talking about it. So this number is the square root of 3 squared plus negative 4 squared. Negative 4 because this minus symbol is really just a plus. So yeah. So this is the square root of 9 plus 16, which is the square root of 25. Hey, look at that. Isn't that convenient? This is 5. What you're looking at right here, this right here, is a really fancy show off -y way of saying 5. So next time you want to say the number 5, instead you can say the size of 3 minus 4i. And you'd be saying the same thing. Isn't that nice? And lo and behold, hidden in here, somewhere deep inside, is a 3, 4, 5 right triangle. So are we done? No, this is not in polar form. 5 is not in polar form. But 5 equals 5e to the 0, which is 5e to the 0i. So, or another way of thinking about this is 5 times cosine of 0 plus i sine of 0. That's the definition. So where the heck is our answer? Right here. That would be my preferred format for polar form. Because in this way, I can clearly see what your r is and what your theta is. And ideally, you would just say 5 comma 0 if you want to write it in polar coordinates. That's cool, too. Two more. Part G. The square root of 5 minus I. Okay, so let's start with r. r is the square root of the square root of 5 squared plus negative 1 squared. Which is the square root of 5 plus 1. 
which equals the square root of 6. So that is my r. My theta is probably tangent inverse of y over x. which according to my calculator is negative 0 0.42, and I'll just leave it at that. Now I need to double check every single time we do this, every single time you do this, you need to double check. Is this the right angle measure? Does this make sense? Or should you try a different trig identity or should you try to conceptualize this differently or frame this differently? Well, negative 0.42 radians is in the fourth quadrant and the square root of five minus I is in the fourth quadrant. So we're good. Now this number is not between zero and two pi. And I know a lot of people get frustrated about that. So if you want to add two pi to this number, that's fine. That works, That's you're totally okay to do that. So my answer is r e to the i theta, which is just the square root of six e to the i times negative 0.42, which is also the square root of six times e to the i times negative 0.42 plus 2 pi. So yeah, if you plug these two numbers into your calculator, you'll get the same thing. That's polar form. We have one more to go. Okay, so this is one minus i all divided by the square root of three, all to the fourth power. So there are multiple ways of going about this. Raising something in polar form to the fourth power is a lot easier to do than if you're in rectangular form or some other form. Right now, we can, we're pretty close to rectangular form but rectangular form is really annoying to exponentiate because that's going to involve some crazy foiling. So for now, let's just take a look at one minus I over the square root of three, and then we'll raise the final answer to the fourth power to get the correct answer. Now one minus I over the square root of three is actually just one over the square root of three plus negative one over the square root of three I. And the reason I write that in rectangular form is because if I want to find R, it's the square root of one over square root of three squared plus negative one over the square root of three squared. Now, if you don't like square roots in your denominators either, I don't like imaginary parts in my denominators, but some people don't like roots in their denominators either. And I think that's okay. But I'm gonna square this number anyway, so square roots are gonna go away. <laughs> 
So this is one third plus one third, which is the square root of two thirds. And then theta is tangent inverse of negative one over square root of three divided by one over square root of three. which is negative pi over four. And does that make sense? Well, here we're working in the fourth quadrant. So yeah, that works. All right, so knowing all this, let's rewrite our problem. So now what we're raising to the fourth power is in polar form the square root of two thirds times e to the negative pi over four times i. And like I said, the reason I like polar form is because exponentiation works consistently. Now raising something to the fourth power is the same thing as squaring and then squaring that result. And so that'll help me figure out how to raise this square root to the fourth power. And then raising e to the negative pi over four to the i, raising e to the negative pi over four times i all to the fourth power just means I multiply exponents. This is the law of exponents. And so I'm, left with e to the negative pi over four i times four. And so those fours cancel. Uh, the squared cancels with the square root. So this is two thirds squared, which is four ninths e to the negative pi i, which is 4 ninths e to the pi i, if you want to angle measure between 0 and 2 pi here. And that's my answer. That's the polar form. Anyways, thanks everyone. In the next video, we'll be talking about rectangular form and we'll be converting from polar form. Thanks everyone, and I'll see you all in the next video.